appreciate you being back this evening and putting forth that effort to be here. Uh, it, uh, it's something we all need, but uh, when we realize the value of our soul, it is something that we will want to be and won't need, in a sense, the encouragement to come because we will have the desire to come. And we will, it would be difficult to keep us away when we have that realization of the value of our soul and the importance, thus, of coming together to worship God. So we do appreciate that you have that understanding and that you have that desire. We began looking this morning at some things which make for success. Uh, realizing that, for example, for success to take place in the material realm, or this physical realm, it's going to be based upon the uh, influences that bear upon us, our lives, physically. Or whether you're talking about a business, if you want it to be successful, the influences that it bear, that bears upon it. Uh, those things have to be there in order for it to be successful. The same is true spiritually. There are some spiritual principles that are needed in order for us to be successful. And we looked at three things this morning. The first of those being the realization of the value of, of the soul. That the soul truly is worth more than all of this world put together that the fact that Christ left heaven's own and he died, came to this world and died for our sins uh, shows the value that God places upon our soul, the value that uh, our Lord Jesus Christ places upon our soul. We need to have that same realization. Then we noted that having our sins and our faults rebuked because if we realize the value of our soul and we're truly trying to attain heaven's home, then when we go astray, we do need to be rebuked. We need to be brought back, shown the error of our way. Of course, this is done by the word of God. That's the basis of that reproving and rebuking. But that needs to be done to bring us back to the way of right so that we can... Uh, have that home with God in heaven. But then we looked also at the fact that the need for encouragement in that which is right. Uh, we all can be built up and need to be built up to strengthen, encouraged in doing what God wants us to do. We live in a wicked society evil society, and it's very easy to be depressed or discouraged in doing what is right. And when we face persecution, whether that might not be physical persecution, but it might be ridicule, it might take other forms, then we need encouragement in doing what is right. But also, the thought that we are examples to others certainly plays a part in, in the making, a, making our lives successful. When you look at children, children are a great example of this principle of walking in their parents' paths. They, many times, as they're young, will get the parents' clothing and wear it and drag it upon the floor because they're not big enough to fill it, put their feet in the shoes of their parents and uh, see that clocking, uh, clocking around because they can't fill the shoes up and so their small feet usually just slip out of it. They're trying to emulate their parents. We need to be 
have a realization that people are looking at us, watching us, and they are going to try to emulate us. They're going to try to follow in our footsteps. In 2 Corinthians 3, Paul writes uh, as he begins that chapter, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. That second verse, ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Certainly is a principle that is seen in the aspect of being an example that we are examples to others, that people are seeing us, they are watching us, they are going to follow out in our footsteps. And again, you see that so very true in relationship to children as they grow up. You know, there's that time in their life when the parent knows everything. The parent is the smartest person in the world. Now, we realize that those children, after a while, grow out of that, and they go to the opposite extreme, that their parents don't know anything. But you look at that little child as he looks up at the parent, and he wants, he realizes or thinks that parent knows anything and everything. That person is the smartest person in the world. They want to be like their parent. we need to be careful how we live because others are watching us. Those children are watching us. Our grandchildren are watching us. Other individuals are watching us. And we have to set the proper example for them. We're going to be known and read of all men. The question is, what are they reading? Are they reading something to the glory of God or are they reading something that is contrary to God? Are they reading something that's going to build them up and strengthen them and if they follow after that example, that which they're reading, they're going to be doing what God wants them to be or they're going to be what Satan wants them to be? It's based upon the example that we set forth. We mentioned many times uh, Paul's admonition to Timothy to let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And we made the point in relationship to that in for, there in First Timothy four and verse twelve that Timothy was an example. Paul isn't saying to simply be an example. He's recognizing the fact that you are an example. But he is encouraging him to be the type of example that he needs to be. That he be an example of believers. Why? Because he is an example. And others will be looking at him and following after him. Even though he was but a youth at the time in which Paul was writing this. And yes, I realize that the Jews considered the aspect of being a youth up to 40 years of age. But still the principle, and that takes from that entire time frame actually, of being a youth. And someone who might be young in age is still an example. People will still look at it. People will still follow in his, their steps. And so from the very youngest of age, we need to start being that example that God wants us to be. And in reality, as we look at things, we really do not know what type of influence or how much influence we possess upon other individuals. How many times do we realize that 
well, this little action over here that I do, uh, that's going to influence someone. This thing that we might not even think of within our mind, we just it, it just uh, something that we we do. It's just a natural thing, and we we go through it without ever thinking that that little action might influence someone for good or for evil. We don't realize many times people are always watching and they're going to be influenced by it. We talked about this morning, mentioned it tonight, the idea of uh, having our faults re rebuked. Well, when we have our faults rebuked, the proper response on our part, once we recognize, yes, I have done wrong, is to make a confession of our faults. When we do that, do we recognize that we're encouraging others to do the same thing? That when they make mistakes, instead of trying to maybe hide it or gloss it over, to go ahead and confess their, their wrong? and make correction of it. You see, by our action, we've encouraged someone else to do what is right. And when they do what is right, they encourage others. Oftentimes, you see this with young people uh, especially, and when you get into youth camps and things, you really have to be careful about it of one individual obeying the gospel, and because they do it, a whole bunch of others do it. And at youth camps a lot of times, it's not done out of true conversions, but it's done because their friend did it, and, and they thought, think thus that they should do it. Maybe not for the right reason at that time, but it is an influence upon the others that one individual has done that. But the principle there is we influence others when we obey the gospel. By our attendance here tonight, we're influencing people in the world. We're influencing each other to be here and encouraging one another to be here. But... When old Joe Blow, our neighbor over here, knows that we're a member of the Lord's Church and that the Lord's Church is meeting here at 6 p.m. on Sunday night and they see that we're at home, what have we done? Well, we've been an example, but we've been an example in a negative way. Because we've told them, in effect... Uh, Christianity is not that important. The value of my soul isn't really all that in, uh, big of a deal. Worshiping God, well, you know, I can take it or leave it. I'll take it on Sunday morning, but I might not, you know, feel too good about it Sunday night. And so whether I skip or not it doesn't really make any difference. We're saying something to the world by the very presence that we have here. And yes, I know that in saying that, I'm preaching to the choir, but now then that you have it, you can go out and teach others as well. And those individuals who aren't here tonight, who should be here, you can encourage them to do so. Why? Because you need to be an example for them. Think of a young child who goes to Bible class and their teacher teaches them, and they're teaching them about the importance of God and worshiping God. And then that child comes back <laughs> that evening, and that teacher is not even there. You can go back into that classroom and talk till you're blue in the face, but it's not going to overpower the example that you've set forth for that child. While I'm applying it to a child, that's true of those in the world as well when they look at us and they see us. When we start realizing that everyone is looking at us, 
Yes, the whole world's looking at us. It helps us to live better. When we start realizing that I'm going to influence my family, my friends, my loved ones, people that are my neighbors, my work associates, everyone that I come in contact with, I'm being an example to them of either a Christian or one who's not a Christian. It's going to help us to live better. If I realize by the way I dress, I am going to influence people. I'm going to be an example of righteousness or I'm going to be an example of the world. When we speak and the language that we use, if we realize when I speak and other individuals hear me, whether in passing or not, that I'm being an example for either righteousness or unrighteousness. It helps me to live better. There's individuals who many times uh, see that, oh, how can I convert this individual? And the true answer is, you need to be converted first yourself. Because the influence and the example that you're setting before them, they're never going to be a, obey the gospel because you're not doing what you need to do. And until you be what you're supposed to be, you're never going to influence them for righteousness and for truth. Realization, I'm an example. And I need to be the type of example that God wants me to be. Helps me to live a faithful life. But then, a fifth thing is the realization that I must stand before God in the day of judgment. As we live this world and this life, we need to have that realization always before us <laughs> that at one point in time, there's going to be a last day. There will be no more days after that. The last one. This world will be destroyed, all of the things in it burned up, and I'm going to then have to stand before God, and I'm going to have to give an account for what I've done here upon this world. Paul would write in uh, Romans 14 and verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to stand before God's judgment seat. And as you write to the Corinthian brethren in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 and verse 11, that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences we will stand before God in judgment. And we will give an account of the things that we've done in our bodies according to that we have done, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Our lives, if you will, will be placed on one side of the scales and God's word on the other side. And if our lives measure up to that standard of God's word, we will be given that eternal home with God in heaven. If they don't, then we're going to be judged lacking. But we're going to be judged by what we do. Now, when I realize that all of my actions, all of my words, everything that I do is going to be laid open before God. And I realize judgment is not a period of rehearsing everything that I've done in my body. That's a, a wrong concept of the judgment. But I'm going to be judged by everything that I've done in my life. 
that's the whole point. And the, the judgment is very simply the passing of sentence. You've been found wanting or you have been faithful. But what is that based on? It's based upon the life that I live here in the now. If my actions have measured up to that standard of God's word, or if they have not. If I've done what God has authorized me to do within the scriptures, or whether I've done things that God has not authorized, and thus are sinful. When I start realizing that I'm going to be judged based upon everything that I do, everything that I say, then we start seeing and viewing our life in a different way. It's going to encourage us to and remind us to do things that God wants and not things that are contrary to him. When I realize, when I'm out there in the world, and I get upset and angry and might be tempted to say something that we should not, and I realize, is that the way that I want to meet God? Remember, I'm going to be judged by that. then isn't that going to help us not to do those things and say those things that are wrong? See, keeping that ever before our minds is going to help us to live and to do what God wants us to do. It's going to help us to live the type of life that he wants us to live. When we push that back out of our minds, though, then those times in which temptation comes our way, it's going to be easier to fall into that temptation to commit sin within our life. Why? Because I'm no longer thinking that of the judgment and the fact that I'm going to be judged by what I do within my life. I'm now living for the here and now instead of the judgment. But if we think in relationship to everything that we're doing, how we're acting, and how we're talking, every aspect of our life. Is this how I want to meet God? If Christ should come right at this point in time, and I'm judged by this action, is that how I want to be judged? Is that how I want God to judge me in my life? That's going to help us, remind us, you better live the type of life at all times to be prepared for that judgment. Thus, a realization that I'm going to stand before him and I'm going to give an account of what I've done in my body. It's going to lead me and help me to live the type of life that God wants me to live. But also in connection with that, the realization that eternity is going to be spent in heaven or in hell is going to help us to live faithful lives. If there was just the judgment but nothing following that, what difference would it make? What would it matter if I live in a way that God approves or I live in a way that God does not approve? You see, one of the problems of our society today, I truly believe, is that we have lost sight of eternity. And specifically within that eternity, the aspect of punishment. An eternity in hell, where there will be torment and forever and ever. There are more and more religious groups, and they've made their way into the church as well, who 
no longer believe in the hell of the Bible. Oh, they say they believe in hell, but not the hell that's described within the Bible. Their hell is, well, you go out of existence. And that's all it is. If there's no punishment for the wicked, then what's the deterrent of living sinful? When we realize there is a hell over here, that and that hell is a hell fire that, that God is going to place those in that are not obedient to his will, and they're going to be tormented day and night forever and ever, and it's described as a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, eternal blackness and darkness, and yet an everlasting fire of torment. When I realize that's an eternity in that, and there's not going to be any, any escape, and I turn over to the rich man and Lazarus, and I see how that Lazarus was carried into Abraham's bosom. But there's that rich man with all of his riches of this world that he possessed, yet he would plead with Abraham, oh, just let Lazarus go and get a little bit of water and just touch the tip of my tongue with that water because I'm tormented in this flame. All the riches that he had in this world could not quench the flame and the torment that he endured. Now when I think about that, I don't want to go there. I don't want to suffer that way. A suffering that, and do I believe that it is a literal fire? Well, it may be, but I really think that God is using a figure of the greatest pain that man knows, and that's fire. And he's saying that's just a touch of the torment and the pain that you're going to be suffering through all eternity. And how many of us want to be burned? I mean, is that top on the list of your actions that you desire? Well, of course not. It's probably there at the bottom of the list, if you had to list things that you do not want, that's number one. And yet there's an eternity of that that's awaiting if we're not living the type of life that God wants us to live. Now, when I realize that, and I really stop and contemplate an eternity of torment, such torment that man today just cannot imagine, the very worst pain that could be imagined by man, And there's an eternity of it. It never ends. I don't want to go there. I don't want to suffer that. And yet some people are almost proud. Yeah, I'm going to bust the uh, gates of hell wide open. Well, just wait until you get there and then you'll have a different matter. when I really think about eternity and I think about hell, I want to avoid it. But when I also turn and picture heaven and all of the beauties of heaven, and I, I think uh, if you look at, for example, in uh, Second Peter, uh, Peter describes heaven from a negative standpoint. And I say that from the aspect that it is uncorruptible, it's undefiled, it fades not away. Those are negative in nature. Why? Because he's taking a picture of what man knows, 
which is decay, sin, fading, beauty. And he's saying heaven's not like that. That heaven will retain all of its beauty, all of its loveliness. It's going to smell and the aroma of it is going to be uh, new at all times. It's never going to go away. And he thus presents heaven from the standpoint, it's the opposite of what we know here in this world. Because everything in this world corrupts. It decays. We are associated with sin. We don't really know what would a world be without sin. And yet that's what heaven is. Why? Because there's not words enough that can describe the beauties of heaven for us. And so he has to take what we know and say it's not like that. And so God has presented to us a picture of the beauties of heaven. And he says, here's what's waiting for you if you'll remain faithful to me. The most beautiful place that you could ever imagine. And it's yours if you will live faithful. There's the two eternities. Heaven and hell. Beauties and torment. And when I stop and think that my actions here upon this earth is going to determine which place I'm at. Which one I'm going to spend eternity in. That helps us to live the type of life that God wants us to live. And then one last thing, and that is that consciousness of the fact that this day might be the last day that I have here upon this earth. Job would state in the 14th chapter in verse 1 that man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. It's a few days. How many? I don't know. In 2 Samuel 14 and verse 14, he says, For we must needs die, and all is water spilt upon the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. We need to die. We recognize we will die. And that's what Solomon would write in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5, For the living know that they shall die. And he adds that the, the debt know not anything, neither have they any more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. But the living, you and I, who are here tonight, realize that we will die. We must needs die. That it is appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment, Hebrews 9 and verse 27. And our life here upon this earth, it consists of years, decades, maybe a, a century, and then we pass away. And we don't know when we're going to die. We might, before the end of this service, suffer a massive heart attack or a stroke, and we're dead. We don't know. We might leave this building and get into our cars and head home and have a horrendous accident and we die. We might live for another 10, 20 years or more. But when I stop and think this day, today, might be the last day that I live here upon this earth. it makes us stop and think in relationship to the way in which we live, that we better live for God. If you knew 
that today was the last day that you would live, what would you change in your life today? Or if you knew that this week and the end of this week on Saturday that your life is going to end, how would it change your life? How would you live this week? What changes would you make in your lifestyle as what you do, how you live, what you say? And yet, that's the way we need to be living and with the realization that, yes, each and every day might be our last day here upon this earth. And then we need to ask ourselves, are we ready? Because we will stand before God in judgment, and there is an eternity of heaven and hell waiting. And we're going to spend eternity in one of those two places. If we died tonight... If we died before midnight tonight, where would you spend your eternity? Where would it be? Would you hear those words by Jesus, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of thy Lord. Or would you hear those horrible words, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. If you've never obeyed the gospel, then that eternal separation from God is waiting. But you have the opportunity to change it tonight. If you've obeyed the gospel, but you haven't lived in such a way that God wants you to live, you haven't put him first within your life, you haven't been the type of example that you need to be, you've not been truly living for him, you have the opportunity tonight to change the way in which you live, to repent of those sins that you might have committed within your life, and once again stand before God and be able to hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of thy Lord. If you need to come this evening to make things right within your life so that you can escape the torments of hell, and to gain the beauties of heaven, then come as we stand and sing this invitation song.